So uh, this year, here we are, 2015, a number which I have a great deal of difficulty with. I associate 2015 with science fiction, and it feels like <laughs> I walked into a time machine. Um, at this stage, about 3 billion people are thought to be online. Now, I think that number may be understated to some degree because there are something like 7 billion mobiles out there. Not all of them are smartphones, but maybe 15 to 20 percent are. Those smartphones have access to the internet as well, and so I'm not quite sure how the arithmetic works. But let's assume that 3 billion is a fair estimate. Certainly a lot of the people who have laptops and tablets also have mobiles, so there's some overlap. Uh, that means there's 4 billion people to go. If it, as Google's chief internet evangelist, uh, I could use some help because <laughs> there's a lot more people to convert. The second thing is that as time goes on, uh, you have to find ways of pushing costs down for everything, whether it's the hardware, the software, or the communications capacity, to make it affordable for everyone. The internet won't be for everyone unless it's affordable and sustainable. So we have a lot of work to do there. There's a great deal of progress which is taking place now. India, for example, which has a population over a billion, has launched what they call Digital India. And, it's an, uh, and the intent is to build a fiber network to um, cover 250,000 villages. Anytime you deal with India and China, add three zeros for any number you have to think of. <laughs> so 250,000 villages, but after they get the fiber network installed, uh, then they want to extend it somehow, whether it's radio links or you know satellite connections or, or something, to another 350,000 villages. So their target is 600,000 villages in India over the next five years. Now, even if they don't quite make it by in the five-year time period, that's an enormous uh, ambition. Uh, you know, I look at uh, at Atlanta and I think, boy, this is, should be easy by comparison. <laughs> Even though the guys who are doing the fiber project, I'm sure, will tell us that there are lots of challenges here too. So, uh, one thing we can see is continuing innovation in access methods, and Google is investing uh, in a variety of different possible ways of accessing the net. Some of you have heard about Project Loon, which are the balloons that are running at 60,000 feet. They are kept in their uh, latitude by adjusting their altitude to catch the jet stream, which is not necessarily always moving in the same direction. Uh, we also acquired a company called Titan Aerospace, which could provide similar kinds of radio-based capability at similar altitudes, but using uh, solar-powered drones. Uh, we are investing in fiber, as you see here. Uh, we are working with Wi-Fi. We've announced that there's uh, an interesting possibility of using mobiles that are based on Wi-Fi rather than based on uh, just LTE, TDD, or some of the other more conventional telecom uh, strategies. So uh, there's also a lot of interest in working in higher frequencies up in the 60 to 80 gigahertz band. And this is uh, The reason this is so interesting, well, there are two reasons. One is that you can have a lot of capacity at that frequency. You could have a 7 gigahertz bandwidth, which is a lot. Um, and the other thing is that the signal dies out very quickly because it's such high frequency, which means you can reuse the frequency more easily. So reusable spectrum means you can share it. Simultaneous uh, transmitters don't interfere with each other if they're reasonably far apart. So when you have femtocells, uh, you have an opportunity to build a very high capacity system. So there is a great deal of um, uh, effort going on to uh, find alternative ways of connecting people. There's one other that we invested in, we didn't build. It's called O3B, which stood for Other 3 Billion. It was a satellite <laughs> system, uh, satellite-based system uh, that uh, is in orbit uh, in the equator, but it's not in synchronous orbit. There's tall satellites that are at 8,000 kilometers altitude. The reason that's interesting is that at 8,000 kilometers, the round trip time up and down to the satellite is only 50 milliseconds, as opposed to 250 milliseconds to a synchronous satellite, which means that the delays in the system are more like continental, transcontinental delays. The other thing which is interesting is that because they're closer, you get a higher signal-to-noise ratio, which means the data rates can be higher. So these uh, birds carry 10 um, spot beams at one gigabit per second each. So they can touch ground stations, 10 of them, with an aggregate capacity of 10 billion bits per second. And because they can see the surface of the Earth from 40 degrees north and south of the equator, they pick up most of the Pacific Islands. They pick up South, south Africa, especially Sub-Saharan Africa. They pick up South America. 
this is a very, very powerful uh, system. And now there are some cruise ships that are installing ground stations on board. Mm -hmm. And one of my colleagues just took a cruise and he said the internet service was really spectacular mm -hmm. compared to what you usually get <laughs> with uh, Intelsat or nothing. So, uh, or Mar what is it? Oh, Inmarsat is, is the common one out in the water. So there's a lot going on to try to reach all those um, people who are not yet part of the internet environment. And I anticipate between now and the end of this decade that we will probably get to at least 5 billion people, maybe more. I won't be surprised at, at a number like that. Uh, Google and others uh, are taking steps to ensure or at least increase uh, the potential for privacy. For one thing, all of our traffic is now encrypted, whether it goes from your laptop or tablet or mobile to one of our servers that's running over HTTPS. We encrypt the traffic going from data center to data center, and we encrypt the traffic when it's at rest on the disks. And we recommend that if you're using any kind of equipment that has storage in it, you should use uh, laptops and tablets and so on that encrypt uh, the content after it's stored. Uh, we are also encrypting traffic on mobile communications. We've been criticized uh, for that by uh, law enforcement, and there's a real tension here, and I think everyone can sense that. Uh, we are um, interested, I think, in living lives of safety, but at the same time we'd like privacy, and so somehow we have to make sure that those are not necessarily in, in conflict with each other. Figuring out how to achieve that objective, I think, is still a challenge. At the moment, uh, I, I and others, I think, are, are leaning in the let's protect privacy first and then figure out how to deal with the law enforcement problem as opposed to the other way around. And you could see this as two ends of a big, big spectrum. Imagine that there is no privacy at all, and some people will say there isn't already. That was Scott McNeely's comment about 15 years ago. Yeah. Um, but imagine there is no privacy. This might be a very safe environment because everybody is known what everybody is planning to do, including the bad guys, but it isn't clear you want to live in that society. Now, the other side of the equation is everything is absolutely private, which means that the bad guys can be planning things that we don't know anything about until they do them because the privacy protection is very strong. Somehow or other, I think neither, none of us wants to live at either end of those uh, you know, uh, antipodes we'd like to find some place in the middle. And I think we're going to discover from among societies and countries that the comfort, comfort zone varies from one place to another. And so I think we've not yet found our comfort zone in the U.S., but uh, at Google we're, trust, we're pressing hard to keep things as private as possible and keep you in control of that privacy. Uh, when the Internet was being designed, uh, now over 40 years ago, um, my belief was that every device on the network would have to protect itself. It would have to decide, am I willing to communicate with some other device somewhere else on the network? And if it didn't want to communicate, it didn't have to. And so the kind of handshaking I anticipated was a, a sort of a three-way handshake that said, do I know who you are? Do you know who I am? Do we agree that we want to communicate? And if neither party wanted to communicate, you just wouldn't. Well, in the uh, interim, from that perspective, uh, the private sector started adopting the use of internet in uh, corporate environments and I guess decided that they could get away with what's called perimeter defense. That's why you hear the term firewall, which was not part of the original design. And it can give you, it, it does help, so I'm not suggesting that firewalls are useless, but they give you a false sense of security. It's possible to walk in around the firewall with an infected memory stick or an infected computer and then infect the inside network as well as having picked up an infection from the outside. And so the idea of firewall protection is only a limited utility. You still have to decide how to protect things in, inside the network. And the same thing is true for all the devices that you have at home. So I think, as technologists, we have a responsibility to give more tools to people to protect themselves and their information. Uh, and that's part of the charter, I think, for providing online services, is to provide security and safety and privacy as well. At civilizations, you know, we have archaeological records and we can go dig and do all that. Well, with digital records, all that stuff could be wiped out. You know, if, if humanity was wiped out right now and, and somebody came down, they would think, you know, probably for the last 20, 30 years, we did nothing. Um, you know, just 
you know, there's no, all records no, no, from no, before they then. Find, they would find all kinds of artifacts, right? I mean, yeah, just none of them would work and they're going to have data. Little thing, this, little, <laughs> this little thumb drive, they'd find a bunch of those, right? Of course, they wouldn't know how to read them. <laughs> you know, there's nothing to stick them in. Uh, I now believe that it's uh, necessary for us to create what I'll call digital vellum. You know what vellum is? It's, it's sheepskin or calfskin or something. That stuff lasts for a really long time. <laughs> Manuscripts of a thousand years ago are still readable if you can still read the Greek or the Latin. We need a digital vellum, which preserves not only the bits, but also the software that knows what the bits mean, and the operating systems that ran the application software, and a description of the hardware that ran the operating system that ran the application that knows what the bits mean. <laughs> so, in fact, Carnegie Mellon has developed a technology they call Olive, like the thing you stick in your martini glass, that uh, in fact does this. It, uh, it captures operating systems and application software and machine descriptions and runs virtual machines that lets you run the old software on what would be an emulated older machine. This doesn't solve all the problem, but it's a remarkable step in the direction of being able to preserve digital information. And I think that it is again incumbent on the technologists in our society to find a solution to that. No society survives if it loses its past. Well, the good thing about the internet is everything is connected. The bad thing about the internet is everything <laughs> is connected. Uh, so the first problem uh, has a great deal to do with security, safety, and privacy. These internet-enabled devices uh, may be making measurements, for example, I suppose it's just a climate control system. The information about the current climatic conditions in your house, temperature, humidity, maybe light levels or something, uh, actually reveals whether there's anybody in the house. It could reveal how many people are in the house. If you record this over time, you begin to see patterns of usage. If you're the bad guy, you might very well make use of that information if you could get it to figure out when the house is going to be empty or whether it is empty now if you could get the access to it in real time. So there's real privacy and safety uh, issues just on the basis of information that might be provided by these devices and sensor-based systems. Control, of course, uh, raises the uh, risk level even higher because if it's control over your appliances, the heating system, the ovens, the microwave, and so on, uh, then uh, there's a potential safety issue. Even apart from the networking, just putting software into any device raises the risk level, right, because of the software bugs that might be present. And so uh, the, you know, if you misprogram a microwave oven and you put something into it and it cooks the potato you know, for a lot longer than it's supposed to, for all we know, it'll blow up. So uh, we have a, a whole set of challenges associated with software related to appliances and uh, networks connecting those devices together. <coughs> My first priority is interoperability to make sure that if you if you acquire a collection of internet devices, internet enabled devices, that they will all interwork with each other. Uh, otherwise, you'll wind up with 17,000 controllers and apps and everything else in your mobile, which isn't sustainable. Second, uh, strong authentication is absolutely required. I do not want a device to accept control or to pass data to anything that it can't identify as a qualified, valid party. So configuration of these devices is going to be a challenge. We have to find a way to configure them so they will refuse to communicate with anything they can't authenticate. But you don't want to sit down and key in 100 or 200 or 500 IPv6 addresses to configure <laughs> your you know, devices around the house, the office, on your person, and in the car. So we need to have automatic mechanisms for configuration that scale but at the same time protect the strong authentication element. So this is a big challenge, and not everyone who's uh, going down the path of building software-enabled uh, devices, network-enabled devices, uh, has really thought their way through this uh, set of safety, security, and privacy questions. So this is topic A for me. I'm writing about it a lot. I am engaging and uh, bringing groups together across multiple industries in order to try to uh, develop standards that will, in fact, achieve the right outcome. I can't promise a thing. It's a very competitive environment right now. Lots of people hoping that their proprietary software will be chosen to be the world standard. Of course, that's usually an unlikely outcome. We have to come to agreement about some non-proprietary way of doing things. But this is a big deal. It's a big problem. It's a big challenge. 
but then so is the internet, so we can do that, we can do that. Actually, I'm much more concerned about Bank of America being attacked by 100 million refrigerators. Oh. <laughs> That's a little scary, too, huh? We have, we, you and me, have a responsibility to do a better job of protecting ourselves. So, for example, if you have the option to use two-factor authentication, will you please use it? Because that way, if somebody steals your password, they still can't get access because the authentication key is a separate second authenticator. Uh, we should not be using the same password for a look. You've heard this mantra <laughs> over and over again. We, you know, as technologists, we need to provide you with easy ways to achieve that protection. But you have a responsibility to adopt them and use them so that you're part of the solution instead of being part of the problem. Uh, moreover, uh, the in introduction of a camera into the mobile uh, plus communications transformed photography and videography and everything else. So what we are seeing is this interesting confluence of things that started far apart. I don't know how many of you know that Marty Cooper is the guy that invented the handheld mobile. His invention started in 1973, the same year that Bob Kahn and I were designing internet. We didn't know about each other. In 1983, Marty turned on the mobile phones and we turned on the internet, but they were still <laughs> very far apart. The first mobile phones weighed about three and a half pounds, were made by Motorola. We called it the brick. Yep. And the battery lasted for 20 minutes. <laughs> but Marty said, it's okay, it weighs three and a half pounds, you can't hold it up for more than 20 minutes anyway. <laughs> so, so these things have now come together in the smartphone, and they are mutually reinforcing. The smartphone makes the internet more useful because you get to it whenever you need it, and the internet makes the smartphone more useful because the smartphone has access to all the content and the horsepower of the internet. So we're seeing uh, a transformation. But, you know, we would have said the same thing. When I was a teenager, which is a really long time ago, we spent hours on the phone. Imagine two generations before, there wasn't any phone really now widely available. Uh, so now, of course, the teenagers don't talk to each other on the phone at all. They text. And it turns out there's a reason for that. Read Sherry Turkle's book, Alone Together, to see what that's all about. You'll also learn a little bit about robotics and how we interact to humaniform looking robots. Read the book, it's worth it. And that will answer more of your question than we have time for today. Okay, uh, I'm assuming you guys had a great time as well as I did. Please put your hands together for Mr. Vincent.